Uh, good afternoon to everybody on the line today, and thanks for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us. My name is Christine Sharkowitz, and I will be moderating today's session. Uh, we are very pleased to host the next event in Mercent's 2013 Mercent Retail Webinar Series titled Leverage the World's Largest Retail Search Engine, and hint, hint, it's not Google. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenters. Joining us today, uh, we have Eric Best. He is Mercent's CEO and Chairman. Hi, everyone. Welcome. And uh, we also have Dan Myers, who is Mercen's Director of Marketplace Services. Hi, everyone. Thanks. So getting uh, into the agenda, um, Eric will kick things off uh, with a quick overview of Mercent uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the company. Then we'll get into the presentation, um, touch on uh, product search on the web, give you a brief update on that. Then we'll get into product search strategy. Uh, we'll then get into Amazon and our thoughts uh, on strategic alternatives. And last, we'll wrap up with um, an overview of how Mercen's technology can help. With that, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Eric Best. Great. Thanks, Christine. And thanks, everyone, for uh, attending today. We think it's going to be a lively conversation and a lot of good information uh, about the evolving position of Amazon in the world of retail product search. And so we'll get into the details here in a few minutes. But I'll, I'll just start by providing a quick overview of Mercent for those of you that may be less familiar with our business. We are a software as a service platform provider. And we sit at the intersection of a retailing and, and digital advertising and e-commerce. And our goal in life really is to help our clients, major merchants, be more visible in their product advertisements and product listings, be more competitive with their merchandising offers and pricing based on real-time market signals, and be more profitable by measuring what matters and optimizing offers and campaigns, and then publishing those uh, wherever consumers may be evaluating or making a purchase. Our software platform is called Mercent Retail. You know, and ultimately the objective is to generate incremental gross margin dollars for you as our customer. And as I mentioned, it's really focused on providing tools that at scale allow retail merchandisers and marketers to be able to optimize those offers and ad campaigns. On the next slide here, we just talk a little bit about uh, Mercent's position in the market. And I mentioned before, you know, we're focused on measuring what matters, allowing you to monitor your competitors and the market, take action to improve your offers and your ads, and then ultimately publish and syndicate those ads and offers anywhere that consumers are touching your brand. When you look at this screen here, you see a representative list of our customers. We serve 500 major retail brands across virtually every specialty retail category. We're typically serving between three to five of the top brands in each major vertical in retail. And you can also see here a representative list of the channels that we support. Of course, we're going to be focused on Amazon and Google today, but it's worth pointing out that the, the information increasingly that we're exchanging with these channels is bi-directional, both uh, publishing our clients' data in the form of product ads and product detail pages, but also collecting important market signals to help our clients make better informed decisions in terms of optimizing their overall retail business. Today's webinar is focused on Amazon's rise uh, to become the world's leading retail product search engine. And that's really where Amazon sits today. They've eclipsed Google in terms of the amount of consumer intent that they process through their search engine, while Amazon, in terms of transaction value, represents about 12% of the domestic e-commerce. As we'll see in a, f a few minutes here, their influence over both online as well as offline consumer purchasing behavior is uh, much greater than the dollar value that flows through their own shopping cart. And um, you know, since we're talking about Amazon uh, as a search engine, obviously there's implications for Google in terms of their strategic positioning in the market um, and the other major consumer shopping destinations online. So we'll talk about what we're seeing in the market in reaction to Amazon's dominance in search. So with that, let's dive into some specifics here. I've just taken the liberty of pulling together some data from our own business as well as various sources, including Comscore here, just to kind of 
paint a picture for uh, how Amazon's business is growing and evolving. I mean, it's no secret that Amazon is a, a force to be reckoned with in e-commerce and retail, um, but particularly when it comes to their influence over consumer behavior on mobile and just in terms of general product awareness, promotions awareness, Amazon has this outsized influence that is represented here. You can see that according to Comscore, search queries for consumer products grew 73% on Amazon's platform according to Comscore. We look at the number of mobile cross-category product searches uh, that originate on Amazon that ultimately end up resulting in a purchase from a general merchandise store uh, characterized here as a department store and that is 59 percent mobile search share when you're talking about kind of general consumer merchandise. Amazon's own numbers represent their third-party seller GMV growth at roughly 40 percent year over year and generally Merson's customers are outperforming that number. Also when you look at the unit volume in terms of Amazon's total sales we've actually seen this number come down a little bit. I think we hit a high of 41 percent according to the earnings disclosures that Amazon made late last year. Uh, but we're still in that 40% range in terms of the total units sold on Amazon coming from third-party sellers who own and uh, often fulfill the inventory. And lastly, for our part, specific to Amazon, as we talk about how relevancy is changing, search relevancy is changing in terms of Amazon's influence, merchandising and operational metrics and criteria are becoming increasingly important. For our part, we are now dynamically setting the price on more than two million products each hour and publishing those new price points on two million SKUs to Amazon's marketplace platform. Google, of course, is still a huge uh, search player in retail, obviously, and we see for Google's part that in spite of this conversion from the free Google product search program to the paid PLA program about six months ago that we're still seeing 30 percent year-over-year same-store sales growth on Google Shopping and that's looking at the combined volume of those three and paid program collectively and maybe even more telling when we look at our clients who are participating in both PLA and AdWords on Google today 30% of the total spend that Merson is managing for customers who are participating in both Google programs is going toward product listing ads with the other 70 cents of every advertising dollar going to Google AdWords. The next slide here kind of really contrasts this fundamental inversion that has occurred in the market. This is Forrester data based on a survey that they ran a while ago and you can see that while the overall influence on consumer purchasing behavior online has kind of stayed fairly consistent in the 42 to 43 percent range, we actually think the 2012 total number here is somewhat understated because we know e-commerce is growing faster than that and we know for our part that Amazon and Google are generally growing faster in e-commerce than the organic market. The really telling data element here is that whereas Google uh, held 24 percent of retail product searches in 2010 and Amazon was only at 18 percent, you can now see that uh, as of 2012 Amazon is driving a third of consumer online purchases in America uh, and Google has ceded some significant market share there. Uh, they're now down around a 13 percent mark. Again, the one caveat here is that you know it's not always clear whether or not Google, quote unquote, is the entire uh, search engine results page traffic or whether this number is tied more closely to the shopping subdomain on Google. So this number may be somewhat understated in terms of Forrester's uh, survey. On the other hand, it, it, we've seen other statistics that say that as much as 80% of consumers on a mobile device will check Amazon at some point during their purchasing process. So here's the key information we want to try to convey today. Uh, it's a framework for thinking about the differences between Google as a search platform and Amazon as a search platform for consumers who are performing retail product searches across this continuum. So we've, we've laid out this retail search continuum and on the left hand margin you can see that we sort of start with traditional organic search which is a function for retail advertisers in terms of success factors of content optimization. On the other extreme side here, we're seeing Amazon's marketplace really being driven by merchandising and offer optimization, 
a combination of some key variables, including your seller reputation, your speed and cost of shipping, and your product pricing. So we're going to re reference this uh, continuum throughout the, the rest of the presentation today. But again, just to kind of restate it here, Google's programs and optimization historically have centered on content relevancy and bid optimization, along with other detailed variables of, of campaign optimization. Amazon, for their part, has really taken a fundamentally different approach to product search, one that ignores traditional signals in favor of merchandising variables, which in plain English means that the keyword library control over creative ad copy and bidding for placement are all effectively thrown out the window and they're replaced by seller reputation, fulfillment speed, and total price, including shipping, as the key influencers of seller visibility on Amazon's programs. We see that both Google and Amazon are borrowing from and influencing each other. And while Google's organic search and Amazon's marketplace define kind of the pure edges of the continuum, it's in this messy middle here in product listing ads where we think the complexity lies ultimately for the retail advertiser, but also that's where the opportunity to be competitively outperforming other sellers can occur. And so we'll, we'll talk specifically about the practices that successful retailers can take in optimizing kind of all three of these disciplines, content, campaigns, and the underlying merchandising offer in unison to win on both of these major channels. So, and a final comment here before we get into some additional information is whether you're philosophically opposed to selling on Amazon's marketplace, either through competitive or brand considerations, or whether you're all in on Amazon with marketplace, FBA, checkout, web store, and so on, we're hoping that you're going to come away with some directly applicable techniques and knowledge that you can apply to your own retail practice. Next slide here is a key channel comparison. We've presented this before, but this information has been updated for the first quarter of 2013. This looks at 84 different brands that are live on the Mercant Retail platform that are selling through all of Amazon, Google product listing ads, as well as uh, we've included the top four shopping uh, engines or ad networks here to provide additional context and, and a benchmark. And here's what we can call out. Amazon volume really dominates among the three channels when we have merchants that are participating in all three and they provide a lower cost of acquisition, or the order anyway, uh, if not the customer, to the retail advertiser that's participating in that channel. The data does support conventional wisdom that Amazon orders are often bolt-on purchases to uh, Amazon's own retail transactions, which results in a significantly lower average order value uh, and order per customer on Amazon than we see on the alternative channel types. So you have real measurable pros and cons for each of the channels that we see here and how you elect to, to capitalize on these channels uh, really comes down to your strategy and your tactics on each one individually. And so with that, I'm going to hand things over to Dan Myers who's going to walk us through the consumer experience on Amazon and talk about some best practices that are specific to Amazon as we think about Amazon as a search engine. Dan? Thanks, Eric, and hi, everyone. So we at Mercent know from some past analyses that close to 90% of product searches start in the search bar uh, versus that faceted browse that you would see in the left-hand navigation on their homepage. So this is obviously the sort of granddaddy of landing pages for Amazon.com and the page that garners the most traffic. Uh, and consumers either spearfish for a specific item using a model number or a specific brand or product that they're looking for, uh, or will make more often a, a more general query, like in this case, ice cream maker. When you drill through to the search results that a customer would get after making one of those general queries, they land on what's commonly referred to as an all product search page or the APS, and will make a decision relying heavily on the sort order. I think the data suggests that you know, it's the products that are showing up in the top sort of third of that landing page are the ones that garner probably 60 to 70 percent of the, of the click-through and ultimately the conversion. Uh, that sort order is generally based on things like previous customers' behavior in terms of which items they viewed when they do similar queries, uh, which items they've clicked on, and obviously which items they've purchased in the past. Uh, so there's often a likelihood that you'll see items that have already gotten a lot of reviews, have a lot of offers, and lots of historical traction within Amazon's search algorithm. And of course, 
they often have compelling pricing and delivery options and SLAs there. Uh, by the way, one thing to sort of quickly point out, we at Mercit focus intently on search terms, uh, among other things, uh, and correctly inserting brand names into the data feed that Amazon requires, uh, optimizing titles, so at least our clients are getting a good running start when it comes to competing for placement on the APS. Uh, but of course, our pricing app really changes the game when it comes to competing on offer. Hey, Dan, two quick thoughts on, on that. One is, I'm assuming you chose Ice Cream Maker because it's 70 degrees in Seattle and it's April. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, so, I mean, when, when our listeners, uh, retail advertisers, think about traditional SEO techniques, I mean, it really is the, the uh, product attributes that become the focus of that search and organic search engine optimization uh, effort, right? You, your title, your description, your structured attributes become the searchable content that gets attached to um, the product listing, right? Although I think it's probably also worth noting as well that in the case of Amazon, oftentimes you don't have control over that. Do you want to just quickly touch on kind of how ASIN matching works and product authority? Yeah, of course. So uh, given UPC code requirements within the Amazon feed, merchants will submit data into the system and will often match to an item that's already in their catalog of uh, literally hundreds uh, of millions of SKUs, if not approaching billions someday. So uh, the, the goal for most merchants is to, you know, while it's important to have an optimized title and brand and other metadata components, um, really the key piece uh, is going to be pricing and fulfillment latency when you are matching to an existing item, and in this case, a pretty you know, widely available residential ice cream maker from a big commercial brand. So on the next page, we have an experience that's slightly different. This is a, a, a landing page within APS for a soft lines product, which in many cases, you know, Amazon's move into clothing and, and shoes does require finer grain level attributes. So things that you might normally see as important drivers to place the success on Google, uh, here, you know, it's more sort of building a customer experience that makes sense for the product line. So attribute level feed data like shoe size or shoe style or width and so forth are part of sort of the ongoing innovation that Amazon does on behalf of customers uh, and requires a little bit more of their sellers uh, in terms of providing that data within the feed. But this is a great example of a page where uh, as opposed to sort of picking the first or second or third item that you see on the landing page, you're actually able to drill in slightly and find a more specific item. So by contrast, the Google shopping experience and specifically product listing ads. So uh, when you look at the screen grab on the left side, the right side of the left side screen grab, you see the Google product listing ads treatment. Uh, and this is a pay to play service that Google has today. Uh, folks are paying for that top level visibility within the product listing ads treatment. However, when you move to the next screen, the products are presented according to relevancy. So as we see here, Google's presenting content following an e-commerce, kind of a traditional e-commerce marketplace paradigm rather than their classical SERP paradigm. There's an obvious influence on Amazon, uh, of Amazon on relevancy here. In addition to traffic or click-through rate, we're seeing relevancy on the page driven by product price, the total price or landed price, the shipping price, the seller's reputation, uh, the seller's volume reflected in the feedback volume, uh, their participation in programs like Google Wallet. Uh, we expect Google Trusted Source participation to influence ranking in the, in the near future. So, you know, given all that, Amazon and Google are really driving to the same results, uh, but there is a philosophical and sort of semantic difference in their approach, getting back to the continuum that Eric talked about earlier, where on Google, <clears throat> it's all about content for the most part. On Amazon, it really comes down to merchandising. At least for the moment, right? At least for the moment, and merchandising in the form of, to be clear, pricing and, and, and fulfillment. So we talked a little bit about that growth of mobile searches, uh, and obviously there's uh, no shortage of data and press about how mobile is uh, almost uh, overwhelming brick and mortar and, and becoming a primary driver of e-commerce sales in some corners. Uh, the Amazon mobile app, is very efficient and focuses on key areas of their dot-com site where they know customers like to spend time. So primarily the home page, search pages, the shopping cart wish list, all uh, easy to access buttons within Amazon's mobile app. And then of course any product search that results in some listings 
All the same refinements that we looked at earlier on that shoes page, for example, are available. All the product details, the color, the size, the different price points that are available from the different third-party merchants that they're available from, uh, all the customer reviews found here as well within their mobile app. Hey, Dan, I can tackle Google uh, Shopper app as well. But I think it's worth noting since we're on this topic of mobile that um, while Amazon product ads surfaces on the desktop uh, Amazon site, it's not currently included in the mobile app today. So really the only way to get into the Amazon shopping app is through the marketplace program if you're a third-party seller. When it comes to the Google Shopper app, you know, we see that the user experience is becoming more closely aligned with the Amazon experience. But I, I think it's worth calling out here that there's still this major difference in that there's ultimately a click-through to your ideally mobile-optimized website uh, in order to, to capture the sale. And of course, this because we, we're not going to have time on this uh, session today to get into details on local retail advertising, product advertising, but uh, Google, that's been a strategic focus of theirs. A, a lot of your success on Google is really going to come down to your ability to capture and convert that traffic that's coming through the app by having a mature, robust, mobile optimized presence. And so if, if you're not there yet, Amazon, of course, represents an opportunity to capture that mobile business. If you've invested in your own mobile optimized site and you have high conversion rates on your own branded mobile uh, storefront, then Google's going to perform well for you. And I think the only other thing that's worth noting here on the Google side is that with the advent of enhanced campaigns, in some ways advertisers have ceded a bit of control in terms of the way that Google provides uh, optimization and management tools for mobile versus desktop at this point. And so it's likely that whether you know it or not or whether you're actively managing it or not, you will be manifesting your products on Google, on the Google Shopper app and on mobile ads. Do you want to hit on, uh, on the next section here, Dan? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Eric. So uh, some product search strategies and, and the, the marketplace mentality that we like to apply here and we uh, certainly socialize among our client base. So what wins on Amazon? Uh, there's three big levers that drive what we call a virtuous cycle, what Amazon calls a virtuous cycle that achieves a certain flywheel effect that once you're sort of plugged in and playing within this uh, paradigm, generally uh, you're going to be pretty successful within that marketplace. It really consists of three elements, price, selection, and convenience. Working backwards, convenience is a, a matter of sort of being in stock with the best possible fulfillment, including, by the way, your potential use of Amazon's fulfillment network and their different programs there. Uh, selection will hinge on having the widest assortment possible, organizing according to their taxonomy, pressing your items into search uh, where you can, but the key is having as large a selection as possible, uh, particularly because you want to take advantage of their tremendous SEO reach that they currently have and have had for a long time. And then, of course, the last piece being price. So we've talked a little bit about that or a lot about it. Managing to your lowest possible landed price, which a lot of cases could include free shipping, uh, will uh, uh, get you sort of the best positioning uh, in terms of your um, you know, capturing share of that customer and that traffic. Uh, and by the way, you can still maintain margins particularly when you think about areas where Merson can help with dynamic repricing uh, and managing your pricing and managing your margins to the point where you're an effective uh, competitor within a buy box uh, offering on Amazon. It retails, uh, sorry, Merson retails feed optimization and our sort of agency model plus our software and transformation services that allow us to manipulate feed data. Uh, and then, of course, your own fulfillment uh, and real-time inventory updates that you provide merchants that we send into Amazon on an ongoing basis. Uh, and then, of course, Amazon Fulfillment and their Fulfillment by Amazon program. A little bit uh, quickly about the Amazon Shopper. These numbers likely will change, by the way, with their earnings report, which is, I believe, happening today. Uh, but roughly 200 million active global accounts, 97 million unique monthly visitors, 6.5 million revisits from those uh, unique monthlies. And of that, uh, it all points to what's probably their largest uh, and most successful achievement in recent years, which is the growth of their Prime program. This program, uh, very, they don't report on the numbers. Various outlets have uh, put the number at roughly 10 million. It's only getting bigger. And given the relation there to uh, what we'll talk about in a second, their expanding fulfillment network, 
uh, this becomes a, a far superior fulfillment experience being a prime customer than it does being a non-prime member. And this is key in terms of what Google is effectively fighting against um, in terms of control over retail search, right? I mean, Amazon is leveraging all of these post-sale services and capabilities that are re really sort of founded in their fulfillment uh, and distribution capability. And so, again, it's, it's just another data point that shows that you have to think differently about the Amazon customer and the Amazon search relative to Google. Thanks, Eric. One other quick data point on Prime. Uh, data suggests that those Prime customers spend nearly twice as much uh, per Morningstar uh, than the non-Prime customers uh, in the same time period. That Again, that fulfillment center footprint, they're able to reach those customers much faster than the competitors, uh, but those Prime customers spend more time on the website. They look for Prime eligible offers, in many cases almost exclusively. Uh, and this is where, uh, we'll go to the next slide, the FBA program really comes into play for our third-party clients. So Mercent is seeing tremendous growth uh, among our Amazon sellers who are selling through the FBA program. Uh, and we can walk through some of the details of how it works uh, in, in depth later, too, in another webinar, perhaps. But uh, this is uh, the way for third-party sellers today to inject themselves uh, into that sort of prime ecosystem through you know, Amazon's fulfillment, logistics, and customer service. Uh, it's a relatively low-risk commitment. A sort of opt-in, opt-out at, at will at the SKU level. Uh, it's very extendable, so your own websites or ancillary or sister websites that you may own or operate can pull inventory from your Amazon fulfilled by inventory. Uh, and it's very supply chain friendly as well. So injections from your own warehouse or from a vendor are uh, not uncommon within FBA. When it comes to pricing, so another component to that, uh, that virtuous cycle flywheel we were talking about earlier is, of course, dynamic pricing. So without getting into too much detail, the formula is relatively simple. If you would like to be competitive and win the buy box, which is typically uh, you know, going to get you 95% of the sales on a given detail page, you need to have a compelling price point. Well, we think, given our software and our application, you probably don't need to sacrifice much margin as a percentage in order to get yourself into the buy box. And in doing so, your total sell-through volume will increase, uh, in some cases, by 7x, such that you will improve your gross margin dollars uh, without eroding that uh, contribution margin as a percentage. Uh, and so we think it's, there's a compelling argument to be made about having a dynamic pricing strategy on Amazon. And the next slide highlights a case study that we ran through where, in fact, a merchant did reprice slightly. The green dotted line represents their CM, and then the blue line is their revenue, overall revenue, and you can see the large spike once they started repricing. Uh, their profit dollars increased as well from, the, from previous, however, they didn't lose much on the percentage side. With that, I'll hand it over to Eric again, and we can talk slightly uh, or a little bit more about some of the ancillary products that the Amazon services team has. Okay, great. Thanks, Dan. So I'm going to go quickly through these remaining slides so that we have plenty of time for Q&A here on the presentation. But as I mentioned earlier, in addition to its marketplace platform, Amazon operates uh, an arguably very Google-like product ad platform. Um, and uh, we've, we're also seeing that Bing is about to uh, bring out their, their own equivalent offering as well in the product listing ads or product ads uh, space. Um, so here, if you need some coffee to go with your ice cream, you know, you come into the uh, Amazon environment uh, and as a consumer, along with the marketplace and Amazon-owned inventory offerings on the page, you're seeing these click-through ads um, that represent third-party sellers selling through their own website, their own shopping cart, and these ads basically click the consumer off of the Amazon website and, and uh, you know, the same way that, it, that any Google ad uh, does today. These are ASIN matched. They're category mapped. So a lot of the uh, basic blocking and tackling that's involved with the marketplace seller relationship with Amazon uh, exists here too. Uh, but I will say that uh, Amazon has pretty forced limitations in terms of open categories. For instance, uh, apparel is an excluded category. You cannot promote uh, apparel through Amazon product ads. On the other hand, you can promote health and beauty and uh, jewelry and accessories and so on. So re really what's going on here is Amazon's looking for uh, product exclusivity and unique products to 
uh, continue to push that long tail of the product assortment uh, on Amazon and drive increased selection. If we go to the next slide, uh, you can here's a quick uh, overview of kind of pros and cons of participating in the program. You know, in terms of the upside, you are increasing your exposure and traffic from Amazon. Ultimately, you own the customer and you're generating traffic to your own website through Amazon. And in terms of campaign efficiency, for all of the traffic generating sort of referral based uh, shopping engines that Merson supports in Q1, Amazon product ads, I think because uh, of the obvious high consumer intent on the channel, was the highest converting shopping channel that we manage for our clients. The downsides for APA are limited category availability that I mentioned earlier, the fact that you are, you know, you're getting reduced exposure within Amazon's own search results. It's a CPC program uh, versus CPA. So you're paying on the clicks, and there is no current mobile or uh, in Amazon app visibility for these ad units. So we would be remiss uh, to talk about Amazon as a search engine without acknowledging that certain merchants are not going to participate in the Amazon marketplace or Amazon product ads for, for their own reasons. And before we switch to just a few strategic alternatives, the next slide here shows you know, effectively what the opportunity cost is. You know, ignoring Amazon basically means you're ignoring up to 30% of the addressable online uh, shopping audience in terms of where purchasing decisions are being made by shoppers today. If we move on to the next slide, you know, th this is really sort of a, a quick and certainly incomplete list of, of the other high volume opportunities. You know, paid search still dominates in terms of uh, source of traffic and Google, of course, is getting more sophisticated in terms of the ways and means that advertisers have to optimize their search campaigns. At Merson, of course, we're focused on optimizing your AdWords program as well as Bing text ads and other channels based on SKU level data, including real-time inventory, real-time pricing, profit margin, customer lifetime value, and other metrics. I mentioned earlier that Bing will be launching their own product ads program. We think that's kind of a late spring, early summer time frame. And Google Shopping and PLA are uh, taking increasing overall share of budget on Google. Um, so make sure you're being as aggressive as you can be on the product listing ad side. Other shopping ad networks. Uh, at Mercent, we recently announced support for Sears, and we're seeing really positive results from some of the early adopters of our integration with Sears through the Mercent Open Marketplace platform. And of course, social and mobile continue to grow and influence and, and uh, drive traffic and conversions for our customers. So a couple final slides here just on Mercent technology, particularly when it comes to leveraging Amazon as a channel and capitalizing on that 30% of the market that Amazon is now influencing as a search engine. We have specific technology built by Amazon veterans for retailers to manage their marketplace listings, including full integration with FBA, the ability to dynamically price on an intra-hourly basis, uh, quickly and easily stand up Amazon product ads and properly match and categorize those ads to the Amazon uh, catalog taxonomy. And we also, for our part, do fully support Amazon's international presence. Um, I think in the interest of time, I've already touched on these channels, but again, Mercent has proprietary technology and services to support you in all of these various channel categories. and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about our presence at Internet Retailer coming up in June here. But before we get to that as a uh, final sign-off here, uh, at this point we'll turn it over to uh, the team and we'll take your questions and try to provide additional insights. Thanks, Eric. Uh, this is Christine. Um, we will get into the Q&A uh, portion of our session right now. Um, the first question comes from Amy, and her question is, how did Amazon become the number one retail online search engine? So I can certainly take this one. I think um, it's probably a, a component of three things. The first is obviously the sheer size of the catalog. Uh, there's so much selection. It's, it's easily in the hundreds of millions of SKUs, if not uh, bordering on a half a billion at some point soon. Uh, that, that's one. Uh, two, the, that catalog uh, is so heavily SEO, for lack of a better word, so optimized for Google's free search uh, that they've got a, a virtual, uh, uh, well, 
they've got a very strong hold on those uh, organic search results on Google for that catalog. And then the third piece would be, of course, their own branding, um, which goes back to really the early days in the, in the mid to late 90s when they launched the store and they invested heavily in sort of traditional media to get their brand out there and have since uh, ratcheted that back with the exception of the launch of Kindle, which obviously now has a much more sophisticated media approach uh, related to it. However, um, have relied heavily on uh, technology to do marketing for them to uh, gain sort of mind share uh, when it comes to their brand. So again, those three things, the, the size of the catalog, the way it's optimized for search engines, and then of course the brand equity, which they uh, started building long ago. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next question. Uh, comes from Matthew. Could you please repeat what factors are looked at for seller uh, visibility on Amazon? Sure. So it really boils down to uh, three things. It's price selection and being in stock. So uh, we talked a lot about the sort of marketer's continuum or that search retail search continuum where on one side you've got uh, content and sort of uh, opt-in, pay-to-play, um, metadata sort of quality of listing and then on the far end it's a CPA model that really looks at uh, price, landed price, uh, shipping, latency and fulfillment SLAs uh, along with being in stock, maintaining in stock levels um, and then of course um, having the widest assortment possible so a selection play where you, you, know, you play in the fact that uh, a couple of hundred SKUs in a catalog from a merchant that has tens of thousands uh, is, is probably not betting heavily enough on the Amazon marketplace and uh, that merchant needs to work very uh, diligently on expanding their selection as much as possible. Great, thank you. Uh, next question uh, comes from Matthew. How do you feel the increase in Amazon shipping costs is going to affect the originating traffic on Amazon? So if I understand correctly, um, Amazon increasing its FBA pricing or the shipping pricing related to FBA sellers, certainly you know, that will force retailers participating in that program to uh, sharpen their pencil a bit and understand which products make sense for that specific program. If we're talking about something different uh, than that, uh, you know, I'd have to uh, research a little bit more thoroughly. I, Dan, here a couple of uh, thoughts just on the on the broader topic. When we see Mercant customers participating in the fulfillment by Amazon program, by virtue of the fact that we're serving enterprise customers that generally have a mature e-commerce business, th this is not an all-in migration to FBA uh, by any stretch. So we see very specific use cases around the adoption of Amazon's fulfillment programs. We see FBA used as uh, excess capacity during peak holiday or the run-up to the holiday as, as you sort of hit peak inventory before holiday shoppers begin depleting inventory on hand. We certainly see that historically, directly to the question that's being posed here, our clients use FBA in cases where they cannot necessarily economically ship large bulky items through their own fulfillment centers and through their own negotiated carrier rate cards. And so this is one that might actually be affected as Amazon increases their uh, rate card for third-party sellers. We've really seen that our clients have actually used FBA as an opportunity to cost-effectively expand their own assortment and promote products through their own e-commerce storefront through FBA Basic um, that they might not have been able to sell, again, cost-effectively otherwise. And then obviously the primary motivation for participating in FBA among our customer base is to A, participate in Prime, which I think I saw as another customer coming up here, and B, increase the relevancy of, I think you mentioned this earlier as one of the variables that Amazon uses, right? If you're in FBA, if you're, and by virtue of the fact that you're in FBA, you're Prime eligible, you can win the buy box on Amazon, the, the add to cart button, uh, for those who are less familiar with the vernacular here, but you, you, you know you can you can basically win higher relevancy on the product detail page uh, on Amazon by participating in FBA even at a higher price point. It's about a two percent delta that we've observed between an FBA prime eligible product versus a non FBA non prime eligible product when you're talking about price uh, discrepancy. 
So I know that did, that that was a little broader answer to the question, but hopefully that helped kind of clarify what we expect uh, to happen as the rate card moves up and down for FDA. Um, going on to the next question, this comes from Wiley. Uh, he has a two-part question. First, how does Amazon determine whether your product products are represented to prime customers? And the second question, does Mercant integrate with any SaaS e-commerce sites? Well, Daniel, certainly, I'll, right. uh, he'll pick the first part, Eric. So uh, Amazon determines whether your products are represented by prime to prime customers if the SKU or the offer is prime eligible. And simply put, only SKUs that are sitting in an Amazon fulfillment center are prime eligible. So that's really it. So if you're a buyer uh, who is uh, working with a vendor uh, over at Amazon, you obviously have all of your SKUs and your assortment in an Amazon fulfillment center. And so those items are automatically prime eligible. If you're a third-party merchant selling on Amazon, uh, your catalog is prime ineligible unless you opt in for the FBA program and you start injecting your inventory into Amazon's fulfillment center and then it becomes prime eligible. Yeah, and for the second part of the question, there is a, uh, an extensive list of platforms that we uh, have live integrations with uh, and for most of the names uh, that I'm going to mention here, um, we've built some extensible software uh, that generally makes it easier to onboard uh, Mercent clients when they're running these platforms. There's always category-specific customizations that you know require some custom work on the on the integration. But uh, for our part, in terms of SaaS platforms, we have live customers on Demandware, NetSuite, Magento. Uh, Venda, I think, is kind of a uh, mixed uh, format in terms of on-premise versus SaaS, but we have Venda clients, we work with Market Live, and then in terms of kind of more pure on-premise platforms that we are currently uh, integrated with in production, we're working with Hybris, uh, Oracle ATG, IBM WebSphere, and uh, virtually every other flavor of hosted or on-premise uh, e-commerce platform you can think of <laughs> in the market. Great. Thanks, Eric. Uh, next question comes from Tawny. Uh, what are the strategic alternatives um, to Amazon that we should consider? Well, um, it was Sushirita Mulperu uh, who I think put it best last year um, at our uh, internet retailer event uh, in Chicago. You know, she basically said the number one consideration for retailers is you, you have to have an Amazon strategy. You don't necessarily need to sell there. Uh, but you need to have an informed position as to why you will or will not, um, you know, sell through the marketplace or participate in Amazon product ads, um, and then act accordingly. And as we mentioned earlier, you know, there's there is the the entire universe of performance marketing channels, including Google Paid Search and PLA, comparison shopping engines, affiliate networks, retargeted display ads, uh, you know, email, uh, and not to mention organic search. Um, and all of those are important, but ultimately, if you're electing not to be on Amazon, um, you can expect that collectively those channels combined, all other non-Amazon channels combined, are going to provide you with roughly 70% uh, uh, rather of, of your total domestic addressable e-commerce market. So um, we'd be happy to uh, talk in more detail about um, programs and channels that might be appropriate for your business if, if you're interested in having that conversation with Mercen. Next question <clears throat> comes from Roy. I recently placed our company's products on Amazon. We are an OEM and the process was taxing. Does Mercen provide uh, uh, the service for, for setting this up from scratch? You know, I think um, from scratch means a lot of different things for a lot of different sellers. Um, you know, we've seen very mature companies that have gone in and, and experimented with selling on Amazon. And, um, you know, whether it was the data integration that they underestimated or whether it was the service level requirements um, in terms of uh, fulfillment consistency and speed um, that they underestimated, you know, it, it's easy to um, approach Amazon uh, thinking it's going to be a fairly straightforward process and, it, and it is, that's not always the case. Um, we, there are a few things that we typically require or that are going to be, I won't say Mercent requires them, but ultimately are going to be important success factors for you if you're evaluating Amazon as a new seller. 
um, and that's going to be the um, the container uh, or data store for your product catalog. Um, you know, how malleable is that? Uh, how easy is it to get information in and out of that system? Um, how frequently is it updated? Uh, and so on. And um, typically, we're, we're looking for, you, you don't need to be selling direct to consumer through your own e-commerce website, um, but you need uh, more structured da data than is typically available from your supplier or manufacturers. Or if you are a manufacturer and you're looking to sell direct to consumer through um, Amazon, you know, we would typically encourage our customers to start with either some form of commercial product information management system, uh, which is often part of an ERP platform, um, or at least uh, look at getting a, uh, you know, a basic relational database in place um, for the product catalog. The, the flip side, of course, is the ability to pr uh, collect and process orders uh, through a platform uh, like ours, uh, Mercent, um, or by pulling them directly from Seller Central, which is really only viable for companies that are um, you know, just beginning and expecting pretty low order volumes on the platform. Um, and so again, uh, uh, a, an ERP system or order management system which allows you to uh, handle uh, one-off, uh, onesie, twosie consumer uh, orders flowing through the Amazon card is going to be important in terms of your ability to consistently uh, over time uh, meet Amazon's SLAs, which are critical. If you if you blow it in the early days, the problem is if you if you go in unprepared, is that you're quickly going to find yourself in a situation where you're under delivering uh, according to the Amazon shopper's expectations, um, and you uh, you're going to get hit with negative feedback from the buyers, and and we've seen this create. And I don't want to overstate it, but it kind of creates this death spiral where. Um, you know, feedback gets worse, um, consistency is poor, and eventually Amazon, by virtue of their service level um, uh, standards, will will drop you as a seller. So it's better to go in eyes wide open and, and do some uh, preliminary pre-launch uh, work on your catalog data and your order fulfillment capability so that you don't find yourself in that situation. Thanks, Eric. Uh, next question comes from Dustin. What is the best advice to give to a merchant who has the best prices compared to the competition, a strong market outside of Amazon, but is struggling to achieve high, rank, high ranking due to, this, to a lack of history on Amazon? That's a great sure. question. Dan, go for it. Yeah, so uh, there is a fantastic question. So I'm going to assume right off that uh, best prices compared to competition means you have similar SKU but not an exact match to an existing SKU in their catalog. Uh, in that case, you've got your own secondary detail page securing a product at a price point that's competitive uh, compared to another similar product within kind of the search results or the Amazon universe. Uh, with that as sort of background, what it, what it comes down to is, you know, like you hit on trying to get your item to surface higher in search and develop some uh, customer sort of feedback and different reviews. The best way is probably through, um, you know, assuming all the metadata is taken care of, the item is properly noted, it's in the lowest leaf node that's available within Amazon's taxonomy, that it's got all of the five search keyword fields filled in, that the title is stylistically correct, that it's got the brand and the style and the, uh, the color and so forth uh, kind of in the title already, that the brand value itself is correct and accurate, uh, that it's got alternate images, um, not just one main image, but more uh, than one image, and, and the images are rich, so, you know, a thousand one uh, pixels on one side. Uh, things like pricing uh, become important in, in that you can potentially spur some you know, short-term bursts of sales in order to give the item some higher search visibility. So for example, if it's $29.99 plus uh, $5.99 shipping, consider dropping the shipping for a period of two weeks during a particularly high traffic period using a promotion or just uh, taking it out of the, uh, the feed altogether. You'll gather more uh, conversions that way and the item will you know, slowly build some of that velocity that's so important to their what they call their kind of king of the hill algorithm. So it's sort of like 
um, getting your item to the top and keeping it there is the, is the real answer. Once you're there, it's much easier to maintain that position. So there's a, a number of sort of small levers, but probably the most important one, um, you know, uh, uh, for better or for worse, tends to be lowering price, but there are strategies where you can lower your price for a, a minimal period of time in order to capture some uh, quick hitting sales. Great, thanks so much, Dan. Uh, we have time for one more question, uh, and then uh, I'll turn it over to Eric to close. This question comes from Jason. Compared to other comparison shopping engines, how much traffic slash sales did Amazon product ads represent in 2012? And this is uh, excluding Google Shopping and PLAs. Yeah, so excluding, excluding Google, um, Amazon still ranks consistently in the top five channels. Um, and as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, it is um, the most efficient channel by virtue of the fact that it's the highest conversion rate among the various uh, referral-based shopping engines that we support at Mercent. Um, I will say that we've seen a deceleration in the year-over-year -year growth of Amazon product ads, which has moved APA out of the you know, generally number one or two slot. Um, in terms of volume, uh, which is where it sat uh, relative to the other uh, leading comparison shopping engines. Um, and so over the course of 2012, we've seen the growth decelerate relative to some other channels. Um, and so it's probably ranked now down on the lower end of uh, the, the traffic range that, that we're seeing from, you know, again, the other leading uh, comparison shopping engines within that top five list. So I hope that's helpful, and we can certainly provide more info if you want to follow up with, uh, with me and the Mercen team here. So everyone, thank you again. Uh, just as a final uh, invitation, uh, we hope to see you at the Internet Retailer Conference and Exhibition in Chicago uh, coming up in June. We're going to have a phenomenal uh, set of speakers and content. Basically, we'll be broadcasting from within our booth throughout the entire duration of the show. Uh, and just to give you a sense of who's coming, We'll have panels and speakers that include the Wells Fargo Retail Research Team, folks from Newegg, NetSuite, Rocketon, uh, including MediaForge and Linkshare, eBay, and as well as the eBay Commerce Network, formerly known as Shopping.com. We'll have Google executives, folks from Systemax and Tiger Direct, folks from the Microsoft Bing team talking about product listing ads, and we would encourage you to come by and meet these folks, get some great information that you can use and uh, connect with us at the event. So we look forward to seeing you in June in Chicago at IRCE. And uh, on behalf of everyone at Mercent, thank you so much for your time and attention today. We really value the opportunity to connect with you, and hopefully you found all this information relevant and, and useful. Uh, and we look forward to engaging with you one-on-one -on -one here moving forward in the future. Thanks again.